participants to this uh, uh, roundtable discussion on uh, extending the body into digital technology and uh, evolutionary perspective. Um, good morning to the participants present here physically at ESOF and welcome to my colleague uh, Barbara Pernici from uh, the Politecnico of Milan. Uh, Barbara is an expert in digital technology and information communication technology, but she's also the uh, five times in the past she has been the uh, Italian women's chess champion. And uh, so I guess she knows well about the, 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 the challenges between uh, artificial intelligence and, and humans which started with chess and then with more complicated games. Greetings uh, to those who are participating uh, from remote locations, following in streaming, and including uh, the other members of the panel, like Emiliano Brunner, neuroscientist connected from Burgos, uh, the Center for Human Evolution in Spain, where he's leading the Ola Emiliano, where he's leading the, the group uh, involving studies of paleoneurology. Then uh, connected from Japan, we are happy to have here Atsushi Iriki. Hi, Atsushi. A neuroscientist working in Riken, the laboratory for uh, symbolic cognition development. Uh, for Iriki uh, now, I think, uh, is in the, the late afternoon, so he's happy, not like us, that we had to wake up quite early. Uh, we also will broadcast uh, um, the contribution by uh, Luke Miller, who is a cognitive scientist from, uh, uh, from the Netherlands, working in the Netherlands. Uh, I'm Claudio Tunis from the uh, multidisciplinary laboratory of the Abdul Salam International Center uh, here in Trieste, where we extract, uh, among other things, digital brains, for, uh, or at least the external structure of the brains from uh, Neanderthal skulls or ancient Homo sapiens. Uh, skulls, which are the data needed also for the, uh, for the work that we are discussing here today. Uh, when we talk about extending our mind uh, and body through technologies, including digital technology, we are, this is not a metaphor. It is really a biological mechanism that can be also tested in the laboratory. And some of the scientists in these panels, this is what they are doing. Uh, the extension of the mind, again, could include the brain-computer interface that Elon Musk has just demonstrated in San Francisco uh, at Neuralink, uh, connecting the brain of a little pig to computers to see the brain activity. But in this panel discussion, we are talking about a more general mechanism connecting our brain, our body, and the tools. And this is a legacy from uh, the, our evolutionary deep past. And uh, why do we need to understand this mechanism? Uh, let's mention COVID-19 because, because this is an important topic at, as of, and uh, COVID-19, as you know, is uh, changing our life, but is also offering the opportuni opportunities, like always, crises come with opportunities. And it has been a, a, a wake-up call 
on the urgency to understand how to better use digital technologies to survive uh, in the epidemic, in this epidemic phase. And in general, they are very important for uh, to plan our sustainable future. But we are also being alerted that there are risks. We need a balance between our two dimensions, the one in the physical world and that in the virtual world. So, if we talk about intelligent technologies for sustainable development, we can uh, talk about the Green Deal of the United Nations, uh, the European Union, and the UN Agenda for Sustainable Development. They promote uh, intelligent technologies like big data, Internet of Things, deep neural learning networks to monitor public health and uh, environment. For example, to predict pande pandemic peaks or extreme weather events and manage transport, optimize energy efficiency, uh, including renewable energy management and so on. And uh, the data and information, as Barbara Pernici will tell us, uh, are extracted from also from social media and the combination of tools and crowdsourcing. So we need uh, to evaluate uh, if there are risks involved. For example, if there are impacts deriving from the extension of our body and our mind into digital technology, uh, impacts on social, political, and ethical issues. For example, uh, con conditioning of individuals and groups using uh, digital technologies. In, so there are problems with the uh, political conditions, for example, then there are ethical issues related to the use of the personal data. And then there are problems related to the individual and social cognition. Uh, so we need really to have a, an evolutionary perspective to understand uh, the possible risks uh, connected to the use of, uh, to the extension of our body and mind into digital uh, technologies. So we, uh, we have to take into account the traits that we humans uh, evolved. We need an evolutionary perspective. So, in this panel, we will try to respond briefly to some important questions. For example, which are the specific regions of the human brain that evolved to become a requisite to support our enhanced capacity to connect to instruments, technologies, to the environment, to other humans, to artificial intelligence. And uh, again, Emiliano Brunner, as a paleo neurologist, will tell us about the changes in our brain, for example, that make, made this possible. Then how do you use this capacity to expand our body and mind into the environment? And uh, Professor Iriki from Japan will tell us more on this particular topic. And then how do we integrate tools into the brain's sensory machinery? And Luke Miller will give us, this is a recorded contribution that will, will show you on this particular topic. So as I said, uh, my colleagues are involved in laboratory experiments related to this topic. So we are not talking about uh, philosophy or speculations. A lot of this work is done on the base of experimental, uh, of experimental work. Uh, 
So the process is known. So this is the connecting the brain. But the, I show you a slide, and Emiliano Brunner will tell you more. Ah, okay, sorry. I had, uh, then we have Barbara telling us about the use of artificial intelligence and uh, digital technologies uh, to extend the human capabilities. Uh, as a last uh, slide, I show you this one without preempting what uh, my colleagues are going to tell you, but just to keep in mind that uh, our extended mind is not a product of our brain. The extended mind that we have uh, uh, co is constituted, uh, is, is, is all the processes, is made of all the processes that we have between brain and body, culture, objects, and environment. So, as I said, these are many, these are biological links, but there is the involvement also of human cultures. Uh, and uh, all these connections uh, are also related. So the environment is also the social organism. So, uh, because we can delegate uh, cognitive tasks to the other members of the social organism. So we have to keep in mind this, co this connection. Uh, and then obviously part of the environment now is uh, digital technologies. For the connection to the social organism, there are other important processes and uh, phenomena that people are studying, but we are not going to have time. I will mention, for example, the, uh, the presence in our brain of uh, mirror neutrons, mirror, mirror neurons, mirror neurons that were discovered by the Italian uh, Giacomo Rizzolati. We invited Rizzolati to come here because that is a, that is a very important uh, component of the brain for, for building the social organism for the evolution of language, uh, for learning capabilities, and so on. But we will not be able to talk about that. And also another uh, process that also Emiliano Brunner is considering is the self-domestication of humans, because that is also a, pro a process that supports the connection we are talking about. So. The group will uh, discuss using a multidisciplinary perspective, which is based on different uh, areas of studies and research, from comparative anatomy to cognitive science, paleoanthropology, as I said, paleoneurology, uh, cognitive archaeology, informatics. So, in any case, it's not only philosophy, and theory, but also uh, experiment. Now, I'm very happy to give the, the floor to Emiliano Brunner, uh, because he is also acting as a co-moderator of this meeting, but he will give now the specific presentation on the topic related to his work. Okay, hi to everybody, nice to be here. Hello, Claudio, hello to everybody. So can you hear me well? Okay, so uh, uh, my aim here is to introduce some evolutionary perspective uh, to the issue of, to the issue of uh, extended cognition. Most of <clears throat> uh, this research is thanks to the amazing tools of biomedical imaging, namely uh, digital anatomy and computer morphometrics, which is a bridge between medicine and anthropology. You know that paleontology uh, has been deeply enhanced by uh, digital anatomy, in particular by <clears throat> uh, tools in computed tomography. Uh, the whole fields of paleoanthropology has been revolutioned by these tools, but most of all a specific field like paleoneurology, which is the digital reconstruction of the brain form in extinct hominids. 
in particular to analyze the special relationship between brain and brain case. So as soon as all these tools were available, <clears throat> we were able to investigate some brain proportions in hominids. And so we discovered that modern humans, homo sapiens, it is the only species with very large parietal bones. Uh, but uh, if we took, if we analyze the solical anatomy as described by digital endocast, so cortical proportions, we discovered that we Homo sapiens not only have large parietal bones, but we have also very large parietal lobes when compared with other extinct hominids. And uh, uh, lay, uh, then the, the, the group uh, coordinated by Philip Guns at the Max Planck, they discover very interesting stuff. They discover that in modern humans, parietal bulging is associated with a very early globularization stage right after birth. And this stage is totally absent in chimps and in Neanderthals. Neanderthals are very interesting because they share uh, with us the same cranial capacity, the same brain size. But if we analyze our brain proportions in Neanderthal brain proportions, we see that uh, our species is characterized by an expansion of the parietal lobes, in particular to uh, regions like the Jensen region, uh, which is associated probably uh, to the intraparietal sulcus between uh, the supramarginal gyrus and the angular gyrus, and the posterior areas of the precuneus at the parietal occipital boundary. So uh, our brain proportion are characterized by these changes, these partial changes, if we compare our cortical organization to the Neanderthal ones. And another evidence come from apes, from chimps. If we compare modern human brain and chimps brain, we see that one major difference is that we homo sapiens, we have very large precuneus. This time it's not the, anterior, the posterior region, but the anterior region. So our brain is characterized by very large precuneus if compared with other living apes. Precuneus is a very uh, interesting region because it is incredibly uh, variable among modern humans. If we analyze adult modern humans, we discover that there is an amazing variability in the proportions of the uh, precuneus. So we have uh, an evolutionary evidence, modern humans, homo sapiens, we have very large parietal lobes, uh, these parietal lobes are associated with, to the, an, an expansion of a very early ontogenetic stage, which is absent in Neanderthals and chimpanzee. Uh, we have very large precuneus when compared with chimpanzee, and precuneus itself, it's very variable, a morphological element of the brain. We can add that if we analyze the vascular anatomy, we discovered that only modern humans, homo sapiens, have very complex and reticulated vascular network on the parietal surface. In this case, we're talking about the middle meninger artery and the diploid veins. So <clears throat> the precuneus is a, a functional bridge between body and vision. It is involved in visuospatial integration, body cognition, uh, visual imaging, it is called sometimes the eye of the self because it is able to integrate uh, what we see outside and how we feel in terms of body. And at the same time, uh, <clears throat> another element which is highly specialized in modern humans is the intraparietal sulcus, uh, which is the element involved in the coordination of the two main ports of the body interface, which are the eyes and, and the hands. The world steps inside ourselves most of all through the eyes, and we interact with the world most of all through the hands, and the intraparietal sulcus is involved in this coordination. 
And so you know that if we map our body on, on the brain, we know that the representation of our body has huge hands. And that's because our hands has a very uh, relevant importance in the moment that we uh, interface our body with, with the external environment. And, and we can say that we can, sometimes we think with our hands. Uh, all these structures are uh, really developed in general in primates if we compare primates to other mammals. Primates have very large parietal lobes if compared with other mammals. So apparently modern humans have enhanced this general primate background, increasing all the, those functions involved in spatial management, body management, body integration, uh, into a physical space, into a chronological space, into a social space, and of course, the integration between high and hands and between hand and tool. So a sort of primate background enhanced in terms of anatomy and function in our species. And this is very interesting if we consider theories in extended cognition uh, that interpret mind not as a product of a brain, but as a process, as a process generated by the integration between brain, body, and environment. In this case, environment, it means also tools, technology. So in this case, tools are not products of the cognitive process, but are real, real elements of the cognitive process itself. And of course, the body is the interface to this mechanism. So uh, in terms uh, of thinking, we have been uh, uh, interpreting brain, the brain as the thinking machine, but probably the real thinking machine go beyond the brain and involves external peripheral uh, components that we call technology tools. If <clears throat> this is the perspective, we have to test something in terms of experiments. So the next steps will be uh, first to test really whether or not body and tools are integrative parts of the cognitive process. Two, we have to quantify to what extent they are parts of the cognitive uh, process. And third, we will have to investigate their specific roles within the cognitive process. Uh, in terms of body and space, of course, in archeology, span we don't have uh, visual spatial functions of the brains. So we have to investigate indirectly the visual spatial behaviors associated with the visual spatial functions. And we have to do that integrating information from paleontology, archeology, span ecology, anatomy, of course. And uh, this is the base of what we call cognitive archeology, span which is neuropsychological analysis of those behaviors associated with the archaeological context. As usually a very interesting case study are Neanderthals because they have uh, the same brain size that we have. <clears throat> and Neanderthals are interesting because they uh, did not have large parietal lobes. Their parietal lobes are pretty reduced. Uh, they, they do not have um, a part in the strong graphical culture. They don't have projective technology, projectile uh, weapons. And, uh, and most of all, uh, they used their hands like, they, uh, sorry, their mouth like a third hand. I mean, uh, much more than any uh, modern populations, much more, much, much more than any homo sapiens population. So we can uh, suggest, uh, we can hypothesize that uh, their representation of their body interface, in particular of the hands, were not uh, as specialized uh, are, uh, as in, in Homo sapiens. So probably Neanderthals did not evolve the visual spatial specialization that we, Homo sapiens, evolved. So uh, we can uh, think about uh, uh, talking uh, something we call prosthetic capacity, uh, that is the capacity to delegate cognitive functions to external elements. 
uh, offloading and outsourcing the information processing to peripheral out of the body components. And uh, in this case, it is interesting that uh, we used uh, to associate the terms cyborgs to uh, dangerous assassin with bazookas coming out from their hands, but really the first cyber uh, dates back to two million years when uh, we uh, discovered a way to extend our body structure uh, with uh, stone elements out of the body. And we begin doing something new and we begin to think in a new manner and we begin to integrate external element in our cognitive capacities. Nowadays, we know that everything has to say with haptics, uh, touch, uh, remote sensing, embodiment. These are uh, really interesting uh, challenges in current um, bioengineering and uh, cybernetic uh, approaches. And uh, all these uh, new devices are generally um, uh, stressing the evidence uh, that there is a very blurred and confused frontier between brain, body, and tools. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thanks, uh, Emiliano. And uh, now I give the floor to Professor Iriki, uh, who is connected with us, and uh, he will give his contribution to the discussion. Please, Professor Iriki. Thank you very much. And uh, we have learned from Emiliano that our brains, particularly parietal rove, is expanding. And as a neurobiologist, I would like to think deeper in a slightly longer time perspective. Uh, this is a graph showing that from millions of years before now, how our human ancestors' brain have expanded. As you see here, this is the modern apes, and this is our old human ancestors, old world monkeys and new world monkeys. These falls into straight regression line. However, after some million years ago, our brain started expanded rapidly than before. This is too rapid expansion of the brain. And what happened around here is that we have started using tools for ancient oven artifact, Ashulian artifact, and whatsoever. So here, some sort of the phase transition like changes have been started in our environment and our ways of living. And actually, I will go to explain about mostly about this phase transition. But this is actually the second of the phase, three phase transitions, the last of which is currently ongoing AI era, but uh, mostly focus on this second phase transition and come consider about the future direction later. The, the reason why the tool is important in this rapid expansion is that we can incorporate tools not only in our body, but also in the environment and started modify environment by implementing the new version of the tools continuously in the new environment. So in this way, the role, the mechanism of evolution has shifted from simple natural selection, which is a combination of the mutation and environmental changes and natural adaptation. But the mechanism is called niche construction, which means that living organisms modify the environment and create a new environment with a niche. Like beavers is a typical example. These are kind of rats or rodents. And this creates a dam in the forest and creates a lake. And this is a new niche. And this is called niche construction. And beaver monopolize that niche and satisfies with that. And different from humans is that 
non-human animals niche construction never go beyond this. They never try to improve the dam, like a skyscrapers or an air conditions, uh, the dams. But in contrast, humans implement and uh, increase the quality and improve the tools again and again and modify the environment farther than just a simple niche constructions. And nowadays become Anthropocene. The whole earth is modified up by our activities. So why the tool use making or tools making modifies a brain and we should have a biological me mechanism behind that. And uh, as a neurobiologist, I started to do what is happening in the brain by doing an experiment. This is a Japanese macaque monkeys who never used to in the forest, but with some short period of time, like one week of training, they can start using tools. In this case, a rake like this. And in addition to this simple rake, they can also use this kind of the video game. If you look from the back of the screen, it looks like this. And if you uh, superimpose a spot here, he thinks that something is in there and trying to take it. This is like a video game. And monkey never used this in the wild, but they have a latent capacity. They are prepared to do that. And with short period of exposed to the environmental changes, they can modify their brain. So by tool use training, which takes like a few weeks only, we looked into the parietal lobe that Emily and have just explained. And here, the tactile or haptic information and visual information related to the hand is integrated. And here we found a group of neurons that integrate both informations. And when using tools, the tool is incorporated into the body. And if you're not using tool, but still just holding the tool as external organs, external things, this never happens. And if you use a video game, this neural responses correspond to the image of the hand in the video monitor and also the tools. So in this way, these modification of the neural activities correspond to the evolution of the tool artifact of the humans. I'm not getting, getting the detail of the, the neurological data and this correspondence, but in this way, we can see that modifying our behavior and cognitive capacity can modify the brain and have, have inter interactions with the external tools. And when adapted to use tools, we further discovered by uh, non-invasive digital anatomy, this is also the, uh, Emily Young has explained, the, actually the monkey brain of this area in the parietal cortex or interparietal sulcus expand. In this case, about 20% as short as during two weeks of the training period. And this is the most expanding brain area in the humans that Emily have explained. And I called it the neural niche construction metaphorically by, the, by applying, to, applying the concept of niche construction into the neural substrate. We create a new brain portion, which I call it a neural niche. And when brain expanded in this way in particular area, what is happening is that this will subserve the new cognitive niche. I metaphorically also apply this. The new cognitive niche means that like a language or mathematics, music or whatsoever, which is a new cognitive capacities that is subserved by these neural niches. And this include like a social space, temporal space, perceptual space or abstract, abstract space, like we create a logic. And this can be applied to the new cognitive function that further modifies the environment by our new cognitive skills. So in this way, I am pr now proposing the theory of triadic niche construction, which is an interaction with three niches. And it's evolved from natural selection into an in, uh, uh, intentional ecological niche construction. And these interact with new cognitive niche construction and neural niche construction. And this interact with each other and, and creates a new environment and new cognitive capacities. And this can be inherited over the generations by extra genomic or epigenetic factors, which I'm not going to touch into detail in this time, but we can have now see the mechanisms that subserve the rapid expansion of our human ancestors. So the second phase transition is this. 
from the natural selection phase of the, our human ancestors, something happened, which is start of the beginning of the two use, incorporated or activated this triadic niche construction processes. And this triadic niche suddenly start expanding very rapidly to compose the human intelligence capacities and human neural capacities and also the environmental modifications. So this se second phase transition, which is the, uh, the triadic niche construction is mechanism for becoming humans. Then having said these, what is the first phase transitions? In a farther longer time perspective, this is the evolution trees of mammals. And here are primates, which the humans belongs to. And primates have separated from rodents about 100 million years ago. And these are farther separate from other, uh, other order of the, uh, of the mammals, but I'm not going into detail. But the point I want to make here is like, like also Emilian has pointed out, all the mammals have slight kind of similar brain structures. These color structure is called the, the, the primary cortices, deal with tactile red and vision blue and audition, the hearing in yellow. All the mammals have this, but by comparing rodent brain and primate brain, these are completely different designing principles. The all, each order have different sized species. And this is the big rodent, which is capybara and living together with small mammals, which is spider monkey. And capybara has bigger brain than these monkeys. But if you compare the different size of the different species of prim uh, primates and rodents, the bigger rodents have just simply exploded smaller rodent brain. This is analogous. But if you compare the different size of primate brains, the bigger primate brain have more white regions, which are called association cortices, including parietal cortex here. And what is different here is that when the primate brain expand, the more neurons and more brain areas emerges. And if you compare the different uh, size brain of the primates, rhesus, rhesus monkeys, apes, and humans, the bigger the brain, the more the neurons. But if you compare with a capybara brain, which have a similar size as a macaque brain, have like one third or one fifth of rhesus macaque, one fifth neuron, number of the neurons of, of the rhesus macaque's brain. And elephants have like three times bigger brain than humans, but their neuron, size, neuron numbers is like one third of the humans. So this is a first phase transition that humans acquired a primate brain, which have a designing principle that bigger brain has more areas. And this is being prepared to become humans. So in this way, our primate brain is destined to depend on the growth. We have to continuously become bigger and bigger in terms of cognitive capacities and the environmental resources and also our brain size. And we cannot expect from that. All our activities are deep, dependent on the growth and innovations and bigger and bigger, economics, politics, all true. And then now the question is that, is there a limit of growth currently? And don't worry about that. What is the next third trans phase transition? Is the first phase transition acquire the primate brain from vertebrate brain and hominid brain start acquiring the triadic niche construction, which converted evolution mechanism from natural selection to triadic niche construction. Now we are entering in the third phase transition. This is speculative, but what is happening to our brain is that with the AI, which is expanding or extending our brain capacities. And this digital brain or artificial brain is start connecting with environment through AIs and IoT. So environment, so our brain have, it's not biologically, but theoretically or architect, architectonically or engineering way, still start expanding even more rapid than before. And it, this is starting connected with the environment and creating the environmental resources 
is not just a physical one, but it has have more virtual resources, which have the infinite capacity of it. So now the phase transition, this is my last slide. We are shifting from natural selection to triadic niche construction. We are up to here now with a big brain and civilized environment and intelligence. But our next phase transition, we can simply extrapolate our past history into the future and can predict that our triadic niche construction becoming more integrated and unified directly with environment through IoT, through the computer or supercomputers and becoming, creating the unified architectures with artificial intelligence. So probably this is the way in the evolutionary perspective based on the neuro scientific and cognitive neuroscience basis, we can predict to ex extrapolate that future becomes something like this. And we have some more time to think how to design our future. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Professor Riki. Uh, we are going to have all the discuss. If there are uh, questions, we will discuss at the end. Uh, and the next uh, presentation uh, is recorded uh, and is how do we, we go back to the aspects of how to integrate tools into the brain's sensory machinery. And uh, so we listen to the contribution by Luke Miller, which is recorded. Greetings, everybody. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person but thank you for attending the talk. And I would like to thank the organizers of the symposium. So I wanna start my talk off with a seemingly very basic question. And that is, what is the boundary of the mind? I think traditionally neuroscientists, psychologists and philosophers think of the mind as something that is created by the brain or at least by the body. So therefore it seems to be bounded by the brain and the body. However, over the last few decades, there has been a lot of really interesting cognitive science evidence that the mind is not bounded by skin and skull, but actually expands and extends outward into the environment and is very dynamic depending upon the task that you're doing. And a very interesting case study of this extended mind and body is the, case, the simple case of tool use. So tools can augment what the user can do for example, on the left, this, a woman is using this extremely long uh, rod-based washing device to wash the second uh, story window. But note that this tool is actually like around twice her size. So it's a very incredible augmentation. And tools can also change what you can possibly do and interact with the environment. For example, using a hammer to nail, uh, to hammer and nails into some wood to build a house, or incredibly using this tandem saw to cut down this huge redwood. And these are all cases of tools augmenting how the, um, the user can interact with the environment. But there are also very interesting cases of tools augmenting something more internal related to cognition and perception. For example, just our, the cell phones we use every day augment our memory system. And in some ways, we offload our memory capabilities into the phone so we don't have to remember them in our brains. And the case that I would actually like to focus on in this talk is just the case of sensing with the tool, actually. So, for example, a blind person augmenting their loss of sight with, uh, with a white cane. So let's focus a little bit more on the, the blind cane example. So in this case, the person has lost their sight and, they're sweet, and to augment it, they're sweeping this cane along the ground, picking up vibrations. Greetings, everybody. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but thank you for attending the talk. And I would like to thank the organizers of the symposium. So I wanna start my talk off with a seemingly very basic question. And that is, what is the boundary of the mind? I think traditionally neuroscientists, psychologists, and philosophers think of the mind as something that is created by the brain or at least by the body. 
So therefore, it seems to be bounded by the brain and the body. However, over the last few decades, there's been a lot of really interesting cognitive science evidence that the mind is not bounded by skin and skull, but actually expands and extends outward into the environment and is very dynamic, depending upon the task that you're doing. And a very interesting case study of this extended mind and body is the, case, the simple case of tool use. So tools can augment what the user can do. For example, on the left, this, a woman is using this extremely long uh, rod-based washing device to wash the second uh, story window. But note that this tool is actually like around twice her size. So it's a very incredible augmentation. And tools can also change what you can possibly do and interact with the environment. For example, using a hammer to nail, uh, to hammer and nails into some wood to build a house, or incredibly using this tandem saw to cut down this huge redwood. And these are all cases of tools augmenting how the, um, the user can interact with the environment. But there are also very interesting cases of tools augmenting something more internal related to cognition and perception. For example, just our, the cell phones we use every day augment our memory system. And in some ways we offload our memory capabilities into the phone so we don't have to remember them in our brains. And the case that I would actually like to focus on in this talk is just the case of sensing with the tool actually. So for example, a blind person augmenting their loss of sight with, uh, with a white cane. So let's focus a little bit more on the, the blind cane example. So in this case, the person has lost their sight and, they're sweet, and to augment it, they're sweeping this cane along the ground, picking up vibrations and other mechanical signals, which their brain then interprets in a very spatial visual-like way in order to replace their loss of a, of a sense. However, case, uh, just cases of sensing with the tool, they're not limited um, to these special cases like a blind person with their cane, but we actually experience them in our daily lives all the time. We probably don't even notice it. So just the very simple act of writing on a piece of paper with a pencil. Um, if you pay close enough attention, you can feel the texture of the paper on the pencil itself. Uh, you don't feel it in your fingertips, where actually you have biological sensors which, which uh, relay this information to the brain. You actually perceive it out in space on the tip of the tool. And so this, this led us to ask this question is, is a tool an extended somatosensory organ, or at least can it be? Um, this extended part of our somatosensory system. And cases like this are actually found in the animal kingdom. And my, my favorite example of this is a spider. So a spider doesn't just sit on their web passively waiting for a flyer or, or another insect to hit the web. They are actively manipulating this web. They're plucking it, they're pulling it to increase tension. They're actively using it as this huge sensor. And as soon as the, let's say a fly is caught in the web, they immediately know where it is and they can immediately rush over to its uh, position and, um, and spin it up. So we, we were wondering whether something similar happens with, with tools uh, when you use them. So can users immediately know where a tool is touched along the entire surface of the tool? So how do you test this experimentally? So what we did is we, we just had participants wield a very basic wooden rod and we positioned a, an object uh, at seven different locations. So these locations are, are uh, illustrated here with these red dots. And we would position the object. We would let participants know that things are in position and then they would hit the object. And then they would use a computer screen with the cursor on it just to move the cursor over to a drawing of this tool that they had in their hand. And they would click, very basic task. They would just tell us where it was. And we would do this several times to build up an estimate of actually what their perceptions are. And to our amazement, um, 
participants were almost perfect at this. So if we take the, the example here of the, of the rod, these arrows uh, uh, right next to the red dots tell you ex where perfect perception would be. And we found that actually on average participants were very close to that. We can also visualize um, the, the performance in another way by plotting their judge location as a function of their actual location on the x-axis. This gray line that you see, it's very faint, shows what perfect perception would be. And you can see that participants are very close to that. And if you take a slope of this line, it's very close to one. And if you look over on the right, you see a plot of just all of the participants we tested in this specific experiment. They were all very close to around one, which would be perfect perception. So how is this actually possible? Because tools, they, they don't have nerves. They're not innervated. Yet somehow your brain is able to, to know exactly where it is touched as if you're touching a part of the body. So users must be tuning into something phys like mechanical that conveys this information to the brain and the brain is able to interpret this as a touch on the tool. And one signal that participants could be tuning into is the way that the rod vibrates when it hits an object. And we call these vibratory motifs. So what you see in this plot is um, different modes. So the mode corresponds to the frequency of vibration uh, as a function of where the tool was hit. And so mode one has a very low frequency. Mode four has a very high frequency. And the y-axis here is just the amplitude of the, this, this specific frequency band that when it combined together is a very unique signature, a motif of where the tool was touched. And interestingly, this is the case for all rods that would be wielded by participants. The specific material size width all determines the frequency of each of these modes, but the specific pattern of the mode that you see here is invariant to the rod. So it's a very robust signal of contact location that the participant's brain or the user's brain can tune into to know exactly where it was touched. And sure enough, if we actually take the rod, which you saw on the, the previous slide for our experiment, and we record the vibrations, I'm showing you two here, two different locations. One is very close to the hand. One is not that far away. What you see is that there's a huge difference, a very noticeable difference by eye um, very early on. And we can use algorithms to try and determine when exactly you get this divergence of the vibration pattern. And what you find is that by about 20 milliseconds of vibrations, um, the patterns have completely diverged such that the brain should easily be able to tell where the touch has happened. Interestingly, if this is the, the signal, we believe it is that participants, that the users are tuning into, this poses a very interesting situation for the brain because this is a signal that varies in time yet uh, to tell you where space where the touch is happening. And that's actually quite different from the body where when you're touched, let's say on the skin, it's the position of the sensors in the limb which communicates the information to your brain. So unlike touch on the body, which you can think of as going from space, the position of touch on the limb to space, the perception of touch on the limb, we have a situation of going from time, the varying vibrations to space, the exact location of touch. So we wanted to know, okay, well, where or when in the brain might this transition from time to space be happening? And does it reuse these neural mechanisms for mapping space on the body to map space on the tool? So what we did is we recorded EEG of participants who either had touch on the, a tool or also touch on the arm at a separate time. And we designed a specific task that allowed us to actually uh, identify spatial processing of this touch. So this would tell us when the vibrations go from time, from a time varying signal 
to a spatial perception. And what we found is if we look extremely early on, 52 milliseconds after the touch happened on the arm and on the tool, you see that these the scalp topography on the left, this is the electrical activity recorded by the EEG across the whole brain, looks extremely similar. And if we use um, source reconstruction algorithms to pinpoint where exactly in the brain this signal is being produced, what we find is that this um, spatial coding very early is happening in primary somatosensory and primary motor cortex. The very first relays from the, the periphery into the brain. And so this is actually quite amazing to us because it shows that your the brain rapidly is able to, to code the location of touch on a tool and on, on the arm um, in primary sensory areas. And we can actually use uh, classification algorithms to compare the two to show that it seems that the brain is reusing body-based mechanisms. So mechanisms for mapping touch on the arm and the hand to map touch on a tool. And what we also see if we move a little bit later in time into uh, about 80 milliseconds after touch, that this activity is spread from primary somatosensory areas into more posterior parietal areas, which are involved in higher level aspects of perception, including uh, tool use. Um, and so this is, a, this is the point in time when the brain is, is probably building higher order representations of the space of the body and the space of a tool. So our findings here have important implications for what I want to call body machine integration. So for example, using telerobotic uh, um, surgical devices to interact with tissue, uh, a very large um, body of research is looking into how to actually restore uh, or add the perception of touch of the, of the uh, tissues into the surgeon's hands. And this also has implications for restoring touch to prosthetics, uh, which is a very big um, field of research now in neuroscience and engineering. And in the future, I think that these findings will have a lot of implications for, um, for not only extending the body, but extending the mind, where, we, where, we, where the body and the machine will be much more integrated than it is now. So with that, I would like to thank my collaborators, and I would like to thank you for listening to the talk. Okay, now I give the floor to Barbara Pernici for the last presentation on uh, digital technologies. Please, Barbara. So good, good morning uh, to everybody, uh, and uh, I'm going to present uh, a different perspective from what we saw so far, uh, focusing more on uh, the aspects which are related to the use of information technology to extend uh, our capabilities as humans uh, to perform activities. And uh, I will focus uh, the presentation on two case studies. This uh, one uh, is chess. Uh, due to my previous background as a chess player, but also because this was uh, a very interesting and challenging topic uh, since the early time, uh, times of computer science. Uh, and um, the attempt has been uh, to uh, try to uh, play automatically chess and uh, uh, become uh, a very strong chess player as a computer chess. Um, the other case study is a different type of extension, which is uh, leveraging on uh, what uh, uh, we have available now, which is the ability of uh, interconnecting with other people, with social media, social networks. And uh, uh, this is giving a lot of information which is available uh, uh, 
uh, in the internet, uh, that can be uh, used to extract interesting information. For instance, here we see uh, an example I will uh, um, discuss later. Uh, we see a post which is uh, uh, showing uh, uh, a flooded area in a town. Uh, so you, uh, you can use this uh, to get immediate awareness about an emergency situation, and you can uh, use this uh, to uh, perform actions uh, and collect this information uh, and uh, leverage on that uh, to support uh, first responders. Uh, uh, I would like also to, to show what is in common with these two uh, uh, rather different uh, case studies. Uh, and we will start from uh, the first one. Uh, so computer chess, uh, since the very beginning, has been uh, a dream of computer science. Uh, here we have been talking so far also of evolution over millions of years, and computer science is very, very recent. It's only a few decades, and only recently we have a very broad access to it. Uh, what is the problem in uh, playing automatically uh, chess with the computer? Basically, you start from a position uh, um, I'm not expecting everybody can play chess uh, in the audience, but uh, basically you start from a position. Every time uh, you have some moves that you can uh, play, there are two players, white and uh, black. Uh, in the beginning, white is playing first, uh, and you have uh, a series of possibilities. In the beginning, you can move, uh, you have some legal moves, you can move uh, uh, 20 different different, uh, uh, in 20 different ways, uh, your pieces, uh, the pawns and the, the knights in the beginning. So you get uh, from the first position to 20 different positions uh, which are possible. The same for black, also the black at the beginning has 20 possibilities and so on. So you see that just after one move, so two half moves, one black, one white and one black, you get to 400 different sides. The, the problem of, of playing this automatically is that you want to, to reach a winning position uh, as a player. Uh, so you have to evaluate your position as the game is progressing. You have to choose your best possible moves. And uh, uh, the problem is that uh, this, uh, which is uh, the possibility of uh, moving pieces in a given position, uh, is uh, uh, normally rather high. This is called the branching factor. So after the very few moves, uh, you will get uh, to thousands and millions of posi different positions uh, to be evaluated. Nobody knows uh, actually what is the final result of a, uh, of a uh, chess game so far. We, the numbers of uh, oppositions are just too high to, to be able to explore them all. So uh, as uh, computers were progressing, of course, uh, uh, they were leveraging of the computation speed. As a human, you try to select your best possibilities. As a computer, you can explore many more positions uh, in, uh, uh, in a very short time. Uh, but this is not enough because uh, uh, the, the numbers are just too high to, uh, to, to do this uh, in existence exhaustive way. So uh, what uh, was uh, uh, the attempt uh, since the beginning was to try to model the knowledge of the game. So you want uh, uh, to um, describe what are good uh, factors uh, in the game that uh, might lead you to a win. So you have uh, to attack. Uh, the goal is to uh, capture the king, the king of the opponent. So you want to attack this king, but there are ways to get in there, so you want to get, for instance, a control of the center, you want to get your moves so that your pieces are able to control as much territory as possible, and of course there are many, many possible rules that chess players are studying when they, they want to improve their game capabilities. So this is the starting point, and the, 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 since the beginning uh, even Turing was uh, devising a co uh, computer chess uh, uh, algorithm that uh, could uh, compute what uh, was the best moves and so on. Uh, this has been uh, like a test for computer scientists to get uh, to be able uh, to evaluate uh, the capability of the computer uh, programs. At, at the given point, uh, 
the, due to advancement of the capability of representing the knowledge and, uh, of course, uh, the uh, continuous evolution of the technology, which was uh, uh, providing uh, more and more computing capabilities, uh, we got, got to 1997, which was uh, uh, a key year for computer chess, uh, when there was a challenge against uh, the, uh, Gary Kasparov, who was uh, the uh, world champion in chess, uh, and he blew by IBM, uh, that uh, um, was won by uh, the computer. Uh, of course, uh, 1997 is many years ago now, uh, and uh, nowadays uh, computer uh, uh, chess is playing uh, uh, just much better than humans, as uh, uh, humans have limited capacity of uh, analyzing position, uh, do blunders, uh, and uh, so uh, this is uh, uh, a result uh, which was a corner store uh, in, the, sta uh, in uh, the state of the art of computer chess. But uh, of course, chess is a game. So uh, how you can exploit that uh, and uh, uh, the evolution of that, uh, Stockfish, uh, uh, which is uh, used here in Lee Chess, uh, is uh, one of the best play chess playing programs, uh, can be used uh, when you use uh, chess uh, to play with an opponent, another human opponent, to analyze your games. So you, you can uh, evaluate your position, you can uh, uh, get suggestions uh, uh, about what uh, could have been your best move in a given game, and so on. So this is the current state of the art uh, for what you can use uh, playing games so that uh, you can still have fun playing chess, but also leverage on the technology. But there is another very interesting development uh, in recent times, uh, which is uh, um, due to the fact that you want to be um, able to uh, play better and better, of course. So even uh, computer chess, uh, uh, programs uh, are com and systems uh, are competing to each other. And uh, um, to explain this, uh, uh, I, I'll try to just give a, a, a couple of uh, um, uh, images. Here you, you see this uh, tree of variations. I was now it's only uh, binary, but uh, here you see the initial position, you have two possibilities, uh, and then uh, you have other two possibilities, and so on. If you expand this, uh, uh, remember for chess uh, it was 40 possibilities, so this is uh, just a simplification. Of course, uh, you get a huge, this huge tree. So uh, what you want to have uh, is the ability uh, to uh, select what is your best option when you uh, play uh, a computer chess game uh, as a computer, uh, and you see that uh, you uh, have a selection of, and uh, you, ex you are going to explore uh, those uh, branches which are the, the most promising, so you're not going to explore, explore the, them all. And uh, uh, there is a, a broad literature about uh, search methods uh, to try to explore what is the right branch, uh, the most pro promising branch. And uh, uh, this type of approach uh, has uh, led uh, to uh, something which uh, uh, was uh, a breakthrough a uh, couple of years ago, um, uh, which was uh, the ability uh, of learning how to play chess, uh, not uh, by telling the computer which are the rules, uh, which uh, exploit, of course, the ability of analyzing the positions, but also uh, the, uh, um, telling the computer uh, which are the good rules to play chess in a good way. The breakthrough was uh, that uh, uh, AlphaZero, uh, developed by uh, DeepMind, uh, who did this uh, also for other games. Uh, they started with Go, which was unsold uh, uh, until the, they, they did it. Uh, chess, uh, and uh, also Japanese chess, uh, was uh, to have uh, the computer play against itself, so self-playing, without knowing anything about the game, uh, and uh, uh, so could be applied to any game and uh, uh, playing uh, just uh, uh, millions of games against itself and evaluating the, the result, and uh, in this way, learning from uh, what was happening on the chessboard. This is called the reinforcement learning and can be applied in many domains. And so deep learning, which is uh, uh, this type of learning, uh, is 
becoming very successful and very applied in many cases. Uh, and in this way, you can get what are called the superhuman performances much better than uh, what uh, was achieved uh, with the previous uh, best uh, program, Stockfish, uh, that I was mentioning before. Basically, to do this, of course, you need a lot of computer power. You have to mm, play millions of games, uh, and uh, you, you use uh, uh, specialized technology, uh, like tensor uh, processing units, uh, to generate games. So, you have to fast, be fast in the uh, gen game generation, and you train uh, uh, neural networks uh, to do two things, to learn uh, how to evaluate the position, and to be able to select uh, what are the most promising moves uh, so that you can reduce uh, the, the branch effect. So doing that, uh, uh, basically the, uh, the approach that is uh, using Alpha Zero is not to analyze everything as much as possible like uh, Stockfish uh, was doing, uh, but uh, just selecting what are the most promising uh, um, uh, moves. So, for instance, in a, in a second you can analyze 60,000 uh, uh, positions, but uh, Stockfish can uh, analyze uh, 60 million positions. So uh, you, you are more selective uh, and you try to evaluate it uh, more precisely with the uh, neural networks. And in, in this way, uh, this uh, type of approach, Alpha Zero is a family of uh, also open source uh, problems. Uh, this uh, uh, was reaching uh, a much higher ability of uh, playing compu uh, computer chess uh, than before. This was a breakthrough because you're not giving any rules to, to do uh, this uh, type of computation. Of course, uh, 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 we, it, when you consider how to use that, uh, of course you could uh, have like, uh, like an implant to play chess, but it uh, doesn't make too much sense probably, but uh, what you can use this is uh, as a tool uh, to be able uh, to uh, support your game playing like uh, I was showing before. A similar approach can be applied, as I was saying, also if, when we consider different uh, uh, areas. And uh, um, for instance, uh, we want to exploit more what are, what are our social capabilities and the ability of communicating information to each other and uh, uh, being able to extract what is the relevant information that you want to have. For instance, I was saying we have a post about the flood. Of course, there will be many, if the, an emergency event is occurring, there will be many posts like that, but they will be lost in millions of posts which are done each day, and it will be very difficult to find them in order to be able to exploit them for a real application. And of course, when you have an emergency, there are programs like the Copernicus Emergency Management mapping system, uh, which are uh, providing very fast maps uh, to responders uh, in emergencies uh, so they know where the disaster is, uh, what, uh, what are uh, uh, the, um, the types of uh, uh, initiatives that have, to, uh, have to be taken uh, urgently and so on. What is the gap? You, you have to find the posts, you have to analyze the images, is it interesting or not? Uh, and you have also to locate it. So normally the post will not be associated with the location, but you can extract that from the text of the post, from uh, um, eventually from the image maybe, but not at the moment, uh, so that you can ex uh, uh, use this information to do this, uh, uh, this type of analysis. And you can do different types of analysis. For instance, uh, you can analyze uh, in the COVID uh, time uh, what is uh, uh, the behavior of people, like uh, uh, wearing masks, for instance. Uh, you could have uh, uh, analysis of uh, the, the way people are um, keeping distances, wearing, how much they're wearing masks, and so on. And you can track down this uh, to a world map. So you can find out in which countries they were wearing masks uh, more than uh, other countries. Uh, because uh, this can also be helpful to understand uh, what are the possible effects uh, of uh, some uh, uh, policies uh, that are applied by governments uh, and uh, uh, also understand uh, the evolution of the disease. So, uh, uh, 
the idea is that you want to uh, extract from millions of possibilities uh, what are the interesting ones uh, in doing this analysis. And of course, you can apply it again uh, what uh, was the technology uh, that uh, we were talking about before. We can filter images using deep learning technology. The computers are quite good at doing that. They can be trained uh, to understand a given image. Is there a person in, uh, in a picture? The, this is state-of-the-art technology that you can exploit to find the pictures that have persons. And then you can add new features uh, to, uh, to that uh, to, uh, to be able to understand if uh, there are many people uh, in the images and so on. Uh, so you can uh, use the deep learning uh, to understand uh, the images. You, you can analyze the text to, to, uh, to do many things, understanding the moods of people and so on, but also to understand what is the location of the post. But uh, this is not normal enough. So what is uh, developing now is a way of combining what is done automatically with the uh, the human support. So uh, there is a, a, a combination of the ability of uh, automating things with uh, the support of humans to do more activities. And uh, for instance, in this case, uh, humans can do different things. First, they can pose the right questions. So uh, what, what is the problem to be solved? So uh, for instance, uh, here we were focusing on masks and social distances, uh, which are not easily recognizable automatically. But you can use, uh, for instance, crowdsourcing tools. So you can ask on, over the internet to the crowd, uh, is this image uh, uh, containing people who are wearing masks. Is the social distance respected? What type of masks are being used and so on? So you can devise which are the right questions to be asked to analyze the situation and exploit what is available around uh, in uh, the social media and social networks. Of course, uh, there is another thing that the humans are very good at doing is recognizing the situation. So you can also uh, ask these questions uh, to humans and use the humans not to um, uh, to, the, to invent the questions, but also to uh, actually do the work of uh, um, actually answering those questions uh, manually where the computer is not able to do it. So with this approach, which is combining AI uh, techniques, uh, information technology, and uh, um, crowdsourcing, you can uh, get uh, awareness of situations in emergency uh, situations. And uh, uh, what next? Uh, we, in our case, we have a project which is studying uh, uh, sustainable development goals uh, with the crowd support. Uh, so uh, we have uh, challenges for climate actions and uh, we are starting a new challenge next week, which is about urban water resilience. So what can be done uh, to support resilience uh, uh, related to uh, water in urban contexts. Main, two main problems are like uh, the, the floods, I was mentioned before, which is uh, a big problem in urban context, but also uh, another problem is uh, how to have uh, drinkable water in uh, uh, towns. So if you're interested, you can follow the links and see the presentations next week. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks, Barbara. So this was the last presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, we have some time, not much, for questions. If you have any burning question, now it's your option. We have also the other members of the panel. Otherwise, I will ask something. <laughs> OK, I will. Just a brief comment and ask my colleagues connected from remote locations. Uh, so, as Emiliano started explaining, we uh, were able to extend our mind thanks to the changes that occurred in our brain, and that was actually a circular process. And we started, as Iriki said, changing the environment. And uh, then with connecting to the uh, social organism and to artificial intelligence now, 
we are becoming more and more powerful. So through technologies, we were able to discover unbelievable things like, you know, the Higgs particle or the origin of the universe or new methods to manipulate the DNA and so on. Now, what I'm wondering, and then we can do the, uh, the very important things that Barbara was uh, discussing uh, using uh, artificial intelligence and digital technologies to face our future. What is going to happen? This is what I'm going to ask my colleagues, some comments to our individual brain. Uh, are there any risks? Because we are becoming very powerful as a social organism and now also connected to artificial intelligence. But what is happening to our biological brain that we know is a very plastic organ. So if uh, Eriki or Emiliano want to say something, I think there are, there are still uh, uh, controversial answers to this question. Emiliano. Okay, well, first of all, <clears throat> I think it is important to understand that you told that changes in our brain uh, can enhance our capacity to contact with the external environment. But uh, this is a possibility. But actually, we are not able, in terms of evolution, to understand um, uh, the story about the egg and the chicken. I mean, uh, we can have changes in the brain, enhancing uh, functions and behaviors. Or we can have changes in the behaviors, ch uh, inducing, triggering anatomical changes. So the polarity of the changes or the evolutionary changes between anatomy and behavior, it's not clear at all. Uh, <clears throat> with this premise, uh, we should uh, keep into account that uh, any evolutionary investment or physiological investment it's uh, neither good nor bad. I mean, it depends upon the employee, uh, how you employ that resources. If you use a stone tool, you can extend your behavior, you can extend your capacity, but you can also hurt and damage your hands. So it's uh, neither good nor bad. It depends upon how you use it. And so there's nothing bad into, uh, into offloading uh, part of your brain capacity to external, to external devices. Of course, if this will be a good thing or bad things, it will depend upon our ability to control the change. I have a related comment. As Emiliano said, we are not just expanding, we are changing. And there are more expanding, expanded portion, but there are also the shrunk portion of the brain. And maybe Emilia, you can explain that in the recent 100,000 years, our homo sapiens brain is slightly shrinking, although it's not significant because of the trade-off of something. So having said that, the difference between humans and non-human animals is that in the non-human animals are adapted to the given environment. So the trade-off is made between the, the stable environment. We are adapted, something useful is expanded, something not useful is shrunk. But the thing different in humans from other non-human animals is that we started to modify the environment and exploiting to the other environment and conditions after the humans became, uh, went out of Africa. And in this way, environmental condition is no longer uh, exclusive limiting factors. So we can also modify our environment to ask our brain to expand many portions, but also at the same time, it requires us to shrink the portions. So the, this trade-off is not fixed, unlike other animals. And short answer is we don't know yet, but 
there must be some rules behind that, how we modify, how we can modify, how we cannot modify the environment, and thereby that requires our expansion or shrinkage of our brain and also the mental capacities. No, you don't have questions? Okay. If I don't know if my colleagues want to make some additional comments uh, in the few minutes that we have here available. Uh, Barbara, yes. Yeah, I would like to ask my colleagues uh, um, who have been studying the brain, uh, what are the impacts that uh, can be foreseen about our uh, different ways of socializing that we have now. Because uh, like uh, what we are doing now, we are uh, having a conference uh, which is hybrid. Uh, uh, we have many uh, ways of interacting to each other that uh, were not there until very recently. Uh, is this going to change uh, in a way the way we are uh, using our brain as well or not? So uh, as a primate scientist, I can tell that primate is social species and also territorial species. And to make a social structure of the primate, we have to establish a social bonding. And this is, it is known that it's, uh, this is established through looking at the same thing. In the human case, this is called joint attention and also eating the same thing and confirming each other that we are making sure that we are doing the same thing. And this can be completed only be through the physical interactions. With internet interaction, like we are doing right now, we can exchange information, but we cannot share the iodine or attention, or we cannot the same food together. We can smell, there, there are many chemical information like a camel taste and odor, smell and so on. We cannot share those information which are lacking in this kind of digital environment. So this is not proven yet. So this kind of only information exchanges can erase the social bonding and which have to be refreshed and updated time to time. It doesn't have to be always, but this is something we have to prove. Uh, this is we are now exper experiencing the social experiment, what is going to happen? And we don't know the answer yet. This is my short answer to that. Emiliano, please. Yes. Yeah, just to say that <clears throat> Uh, we are primates are social uh, and we have as humans we are primates and we have a fixed social program uh, inside so uh, if our next social development will go in a good or bad direction it will depend how on how much we will be able to integrate the social evolution our social digital evolution with our fixed social programs as primates. Well, we saw during the COVID-19 lockdown, uh, you know, how strong these uh, programs in Homo sapiens is, the one about sociality. And uh, people really could not stand anymore the isolation. So that is really the primate behavior coming out, I think. But, uh, Ricky, you don't have any other comments on this conflict between being primates and also now being very similar to social insects in terms of social behavior? Oh, well, well, social interaction is essential, but at the, at the same time, human brain need isolation. If you remind how the Isaac Newton have invented the theory of gravity, it was during the lockdown of, of the pest pand pandemic, I guess. And he had secured the life and isolation with a good isolation and incubated idea. 
And sometimes we need that. Maybe our digital socializing equipment are preventing that kind of the deep thinking and which are not aware of that explicitly, but we have to be care keep in mind that humans need that kind of thing as well. We have to well control how we can socialize through this, this digital environment. Maybe not always at all time, but sometimes, you know, we'll see. Well, yeah, there was an interesting discussion here at Azov on the mixing that we need now between the big theories, like in medicine, in physics, and the artificial intelligence capabilities, because we can use algorithms to study the data that we have to understand in physics, in medicine, and, and so on. And we still don't know what is the fraction of this individual thinking that you are now mentioning and the contribution coming both, well, now particularly from the intelligent algorithms and uh, uh, deep neural networks and, and so on that can help us to develop these big theories. So this is something that people are, 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 are asking. <laughs> Okay, I think uh, I just used the 17 seconds that we have to thank all my colleagues for their contribution and uh, we hope to see you in the real physical world sometimes. And thanks also to all the people that came here to follow physically this event and also to all the people that uh, connected to follow the discussion streaming. Thank you very much and greetings from Trieste. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everybody.